Worshippers enter today. Uh, I've got a special treat for you this morning. On uh, this morning, we're going to be blessed uh, through the word by Reverend Victor Burks. He's going to bless us through the word today, and I want you to pray for him. Uh, he's been with us a little over a year now, about almost two years now, huh? He and his family have been with us and uh, giving leadership to so many various areas uh, of our church, and uh, we're excited about him being with us and excited to hear him. Uh, what God will say to him through the word today. Uh, he's been my friend for several years, and I was very excited when he joined our church. And uh, he got in and, I mean, and just, and just been working like a workhorse. And I thank God for him uh, on today. Amen. So I want you to pray for him and uh, bring your amens and don't let him preach all by himself. And uh, say amen. Uh, say thank you, Lord. Uh, do like y'all do me, uh, throw keys at them and all that kind of stuff. And uh, help really help them preach. Uh, one of the benefits of the African-American tradition of preaching, of which I'm a student of, is that the congregation actually preaches almost as much as the preacher that's preaching. And uh, you, really, you really do, as a black preacher, you feed off that. And so I want y'all to uh, be true to our African-American tradition today and help them preach. Our choir is going to sing, and after our choir sings, the next voice you will hear is my friend and brother in the ministry, uh, Reverend Victor Burks. Come on, let's bless the Lord for him today. Come on, Burks, you're in the hot seat, Doc. Go on, sit in the hot seat, Doc. Yeah, you're in the hot seat today. Hey, Amen. Let's pray for this morning. Let's receive our choir as they come to bless us. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
got up. If Jesus has done anything for you, you ought to be able to say amen. Amen. It is, I just bring all praise and honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for waking me up this morning and giving me another opportunity to stand before you. And I want to give a special thank you this morning to Pastor Hutchinson. Uh, I do not take this opportunity lightly. I tell him oftentimes, privately, anytime he allows me to stand. I don't know if any of you know this or not, but whenever the angel of a house just allows someone else to stand and preach to his flock, uh, that's a big thing. He's instilled a great deal of confidence in me, and, and I thank him for that. I'm going to get him a little later on for putting me in that figuratively and literally big seat that's directly behind me. I don't feel comfortable in that. Uh, amen. Amen. But without any further delay, as I've said, thank you, God. Uh, I've said many times, if the times any of you have heard me preach when I've been given the opportunity, I have good news and I have great news. The good news is I won't be long. About 23 minutes, as I spent about two of them just then. And the great news is there is a word from the Lord. If you would, and those of you who can stand, would you stand at the reading of God's word uh, and turn with me to a book of Psalms, book of Psalms 23, a familiar, very familiar and uh, famous passage of scripture. I just, I just want to, really just want to focus on verse 1 and then close with verses through 2, 6, but I, I don't have the ability, I didn't get that portion to hoop it like pastor can, but we can just, but I want to Primarily, commencing with verse 1 and concluding with verse 6. Look at what the word of God says. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's enough. We'll just go from right there. You may be seated at the reading and hearing of God's word. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. If I could just for a few moments here tag this text with the title of Sure, Secure, and Satisfied with the Savior. There are very few things in this life, church, that we are sure of. The world says death. We all know we have a birth date and a death date. We know that on April 15th, that three-letter word start with an I and with an S, that company is going to be looking for something by way of taxes for us. But if I could, just one brief moment, because I told him I was going to get him. If you are a member of Sunlight, and if you happen to be here between the months of September and December, you also can be sure of that you will hear a word from Pastor Hutchinson about his love for that team that plays football down 45 North. I can't say that name, but uh, you, can, you can be sure. I didn't give it that hyperbolic statement of great team. But, but to a lesser degree, church, do we feel secure about much in this life? Job, constantly downsizing. That was a time when you could feel secure in your job. Marriage used to be forever. Nice for as long as I can feel like being around you. You're not secure anymore. But even to a lesser degree, are we satisfied with the outlook of our daily lives? How many of you know that many people every day, all day long, live in constant fear day by day of what tomorrow may or may not bring? But if I can stop for a moment and kind of steal something that Pastor says, I'm going to victorize it a little bit. If you don't get anything else I say, get this, as I give a brief synopsis of the sermon in a sentence. As Christians, because we know the Lord, no matter what the circumstances or situation we find ourselves in, we can be sure, sure, secure, and satisfied in the Lord. Here we find at the time of this text, David, the writer of this famous and familiar passage of scripture, is once again on the run. You know David. That's the same David who, as a ruddy little boy, was anointed king by Solomon. 
The same David that slayed the giant Goliath. That same David that slept with Bathsheba and had Uriah killed. That same David who survived the first attack by his life by Saul. That same David who was run, run over and run by by his own son and chased and sought to be killed. That same David who God called a man after his own heart. He finds himself now wandering from place to place, literally exiled from his own people, living amongst strangers in strange places and sometimes even with his enemies. But in spite of his life continually being threatened and in spite of the precarious and perilous positions that he was in, he found himself, he found himself in David still found comfort and peace and confidence in knowing that he had a shepherd. I just have to believe in my sanctified mind that at some point during the trials and tribulations that David was going through, that he started reflecting back when he was a shepherd of sheep, when he had to, when he had to protect his sheep from the lions and the, and the bears. I have to believe that maybe he may have remembered back when he was on the run from his son and all those different situations. In every situation in his life, he found himself still looking and knowing that he had a shepherd to protect him. Like David, we too must consider in times of great distress and despair, church, that we have a shepherd whom we can be sure of, secure in, and sacrifice in. Sure, secure, and satisfied in the Savior. If you can just give me the next 18 minutes or so, I'd want to be able to touch about three points here about being sure, secure, and satisfied in the Savior. The first thing I want you to see in this text is verse 1. It won't go too fast. We need to read it. He says, the Lord. Can I just park right there for a moment? The first thing you need to understand is you need to know and recognize the Lord as a person. The word know here, I'm talking about know through experience. I'm not talking about knowing intellectually. I'm talking about know him from the standpoint of intimacy in your life, not your intellect. You know him because he saved you when you couldn't save yourself. I'm just talking about knowing, but then recognizing the Lord's person. See, this song begins and it ends with, if you look at it, if you have closed your Bible, and I can just drop this in parenthetically, you know what we say here. Whatever you do, don't close your Bible. If you look at the verse 1, it says the Lord, but if you go to verse 6 at the end, it also says the Lord. So literally, the psalm ends and begins with the Lord. See, David, knowing and recognizing the Lord, establishes some things the importance and the relationship between him and the Lord. Likewise, as Christians, our lives begin with and end with the Lord. It is in him we move and in him we find our being. See, David knew some things. David knew from experience who the Lord was. Therefore, he referred to God as who God was to him. Y'all to get that in a minute. Let me just say it this way. David didn't call him Elohim, the great and mighty creator who is separate from the world. He didn't call him Elohim Avenue, the God our Father. He didn't call him El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God. He did not call him Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who sees and knows my needs are provided. He did not call him Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my miracle. He did not call him Jehovah Shalom, the Lord of peace. He called him Jehovah, that's what it translates to, the Lord, the personal name of the true God, that covenant-keeping God. He said, the Lord. See, when you know somebody personally, you can call them by their personal name. See, when you have a personal relationship with someone, you call them by their proper name and not by their profession. Can I just give you an example? My name is Victor Dwayne Burks. But those in sunlight here call me Reverend Burks. That's my position. But Victor is a person. And if you know me personally, you'll be able to call me Victor. See, when you know, let me say it like this. When you know God, when you know who God is to you personally, you can call on him personally for you. Oh, I said, let me say that, I said it the wrong way. When you know who God is personally to you, you can call on him personally for you. See, when family is feuding with you, you can call on the name of the Lord. When friends are few and far between, and sometimes fake and fickle, you can call on the Lord. When your finances is funny, your money is funny, your change is strange, not only are they meeting in the same area, because they're not even meeting the same area code. 
You can call on the name of the Lord. When your foes are fighting against you, you can call on the name of the Lord. So now we understand the personal name of the Lord, who he is. That's the primary thing, primarily. But then also in this same verse, we see a period of time in the Lord, when he is. Now, if you haven't closed your Bible, you, it, it's in there. The first thing he said was the Lord, but then there's a present tense verb that says is. Well, I'm going to be here for a minute. For years. Notice that he did not say the Lord might be. That's for the folk who got flawed and fickle faith. He didn't say the Lord will be. That's for folks who plan to get closer to God a little later on, like they got time. He didn't say the Lord was, but the folks that always speak about what God has done for them. He said the Lord is. It's a present tense verb that basically indicates a, a current or a continuous action. It's an indicative mood, this little grammar here, which means it's a fact. And it's in the active voice, which means the person doing the, the subject is the one doing the acting. In other words, the Lord is present. He's a right now God. The Lord is perpetual. He will continue to be a right now God. And he's permanent. He will never stop being a right now God. That didn't get you. Let me say it this way. Maybe it's like this. Maybe you can just fill it in the way you want to fill it in. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is a rock in the weary land. The Lord is a refuge and my strength. The Lord is my redeemer and my savior. The Lord is a way out of no way. The Lord is a bridge over triple wall. Whatever you want to say it, however you want to say it, go ahead and say it. But David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm trying to move on here. Not only do you need to know and recognize the Lord's person, to let you know who he is and when he is so you can be sure about it. The second thing I want you to see in this text, we're still in verse 1, is know and respect the Lord's position. If you didn't close your Bible, it's in there. Know and respect, I already told you about the know, but respect the Lord's position. He says the Lord is my shepherd. Personal pronoun my right. indicates possession. So he lets you know whose he is and what he is. See, you can feel secure with something when it belongs to you. The, David didn't say the Lord is a shepherd, i.e. making God uh, amongst one of many shepherds. Because you do know we have various shepherds in our life. You know, shepherds lead, guide, and protect. The job leads you. The family leads you. The bank account leads you. Stop me when I get on your street. Whatever it is that's leading you. He didn't say a shepherd. He says, I'll get there in a minute. He says, not only that, he didn't say the Lord is the shepherd. That makes God important, but impersonal. He didn't say the Lord is our shepherd. That makes God relate to me as one of amongst many others. He said the Lord is my shepherd. That makes God belong to me and me alone personally and I to him. See, I don't know about you, but I want my relationship with God to be about me and only me, personal to me. I can't claim it for you, but I can, but I can, but I can claim it for myself. The song says, I don't know what he is to you, but I know what he is to me. See, not only does David speak about his personal relationship with the Lord, but he also recognized the Lord's position. Is it in there? Let me see. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. That's his position. Now, you know, every position that you have has a purpose. The purpose of the shepherd is to lead, guide, protect, and provide for his sheep. You know, I found, I was doing a little research on sheep. And there's about 15, 16 different characteristics they talked about about sheep. And I don't have time today to go through all 15 to 16 of them. But I just want to touch on three. Sheep are sometimes stubborn. Sheep are sometimes stinky. And sheep are sometimes stupid. 
Can I just press a little bit? Sheep want to go their own way, do their own thing. When they want to do it, how they want to do it, with who they want to do it with, not following the advice and the leadership of the shepherds. They wander off a lot of times and get lost, only be brought back into the fold by the shepherds. Now y'all know I really ain't talking about no sheep. Pastor God's under shepherd has been given the role and responsibility to lead us, but I'm gonna leave that alone. You know how every now and again, you know we talk about the rod and the staff, Typically, that's one, one piece on one end as a hook. Yeah. No, the other end is straight. See, the shepherd's job, I told you, is to provide and protect for the sheep. And every now and again, when the sheep wanders off, he got to flip it and put the hook side on and pull him back. But not only does he have to do that every now and again, the lion and the bear come along to come and get after you, and he got to flip it around again and get him off him, get off his sheep, just protect, protecting and providing for him. Not only do we find that they're sometimes stubborn, but sheep are sometimes stinking. Now you know, sheep, they don't do anything to bathe themselves. They don't roll around, scrape around in the mud. They don't lick themselves, they just downright filthy. Now y'all know I really ain't talking about sheep. God sees us as filthy rags. Born in sin, shaped in iniquity, crooked and perverse, which means we can never be straight. But we are cleansed, thank God, and purified by the blood of the good shepherd. They're stubborn, stinky, but then sometimes they're stupid. Y'all do realize that ignorance can't be fixed, but stupid is forever. A stupid sheep will consume eat any and everything in its path that are hazardous and harmful to its health and think nothing of it. Listen to anything and anybody except the one they ought to listen to. Y'all know I really ain't talking about no sheep. We tend to eat up the latest concepts and cures for life when all we really need to do is listen and adhere to what the under shepherd preaches every Sunday from the book of life. Sometimes, but if you know or when you know the Lord as a person, knowing his presence is perpetual and permanent, and knowing that his position and purpose is uniquely personal to you, you can do this. You can make a profound proclamation. Are y'all still with me? I'm on the last part of verse one. Here's a, here's a profound proclamation. He says, I shall not want. That's just talking about being satisfied. See, David didn't say, I might not want. He was pretty clear with what he said. He didn't say, I may not want. He didn't say, I'm probably not going to want. He said, I shall not want. But can I just park here for a second? Anytime you see shall, will in the Bible, it denotes a definitive action. It's going to take place. You can text it, Snapchat it, write it down, tweet it, whatever you want to do with it, it's going to be done. See, David could be bold in his statement, his proclamation, because he knew the God he served and is the God who is willing and able to take care of him in spite of the situation. Now, let me just drop this in parenthetic because I don't want to give David too much credit. He wasn't so much about what David was going to do. It's more about what he knew God was going to do. That word won't means to lack or be lacking. The question is, what will you not lack? And can you make that profound proclamation? And the third point was, and I went over it, was it's basically this, that you need to now know and receive God's provision. Can I show you what the provisions are? I'm glad you asked, as Pastor was saying. If you start at verse 2 through 6, there's the provisions right there. Just follow along with me as I kind of talk on them just a little bit. And I'll take my seat. He said, what you won't lack, if you are in desi desiring some calm in your life, 
the text says he makes me to lie down in green pastures. That means he'll provide you with some rest. If you are in the midst of some chaos in verse 2b, he says he leads me beside the still waters. That provides you a bit of relaxation. In verse 3, just in case you've been consumed by life's trials and tribulations, he says he restores my soul. That gives you restoration. But now in verse 3b, he says, now if you get confused about being carnal or spiritual, he says he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. That means he gives you some righteousness. But if you move on to verse 4a, if you happen to be confronted by darkness and despair, he says, even though I walk, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod, remember the rod and your staff? They comfort me. That means he give you residence in the spirit. Now in verse 5, he says, if you happen to get conspired against by your enemies, he says, I will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. That means I'll protect you. In verse 5, he says, well, look, if you happen to be cut down by the words of those same enemies, he says, you anointed my head with all my cup runneth over, it gives you the power to carry on. But again, to the good part now. But he says, not only that, if you happen to be lacking some companionship, he says, surely, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That means you're going to have his presence and his reassurance. But here's my favorite part here in verse 6b. He says, that's the conclusion of my life. I shall dwell, I told you my shall, in the house of the Lord forever. That means you ought to be confident in knowing that God provides you with protection and a permanent residence with him. Now, can I just head to a close? See, I wish I could hoop this part right here. But see, if you want to be sure and secure and satisfied in the Savior, you have to know and recognize the Lord's person, and you can call him because you know who he is to you. And then not only that, you know and respect him, his position, you can claim him for whose he is and what he is to you. And then you can know and receive his provisions and you can be content and satisfied in him for what he's doing for you right now. Now, I don't know about you, but I know I'm sure and secure. I'm sure it's about, I'm secure in, and I'm satisfied with the Lord. Why? Because he came down for 42 generations. He walked the streets of Galilee. He labored in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went to a hill called Golgotha. They spiked his hands. They nailed his feet. They pierced his side. They stretched him wide and hung him high. He hung his head, and then he died. He died for you, and he died for me. You ought to be sure because he died. You ought to be secure because he died. You ought to be satisfied because he's your savior. But if that don't fit you, I believe when they buried him, because they were sure that he was dead. They closed him in in the rock, and they felt secure that the rock was going to hold him. They were satisfied in what they had done because they thought the job they had done was well done. But the Bible says on early Sunday morning, yeah. he got up with our power in his hand. Now if that ain't enough, they said you will not find him here. You ought to be sure because he ain't there. You ought to be secure because he ain't there. You ought to be secure in your faith because he ain't there. You ought to be satisfied with Savior because he ain't there. Yeah. You ought to be secure, sure, and satisfied with the Savior. May God bless you and keep you. One more time, let's celebrate God for the man of God and for the word of God. Father, we thank you today for your word. Thank you for the outpouring of your spirit through your servant, Reverend Burks, reminding us that we can indeed be sure, 
can be secured, and we can be satisfied. Now, as we open the door of the church, there may be someone who's here today who's not sure of where they'll spend eternity. They're not secured in their salvation. They're not able to be satisfied with the Savior. Today, as the choir sings, may they get up out of their seat, come down the aisle and make a decision to make the Lord their shepherd that they shall not want. Whoever it is today, Lord, man, woman, boy or girl, may they not grieve the spirit or quench the spirit, but respond to what the spirit has said through his word, through his servant. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. It's given us the secret of life that's satisfied in the Lord, that if we make the Lord our shepherd, he'll satisfy all of our needs. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, one more time. Let's bless that wonderful name of Jesus. You're good. You're good, Bert. You're good, Bert. Have a seat. We'll get it. We'll get it. The door of the church is open. Our leaders are standing in the aisle. And today, if you heard the word today and you're saying to yourself, I, I need to be, I need to be sure. I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I want you to hear me. This is very serious. Right from the man of God's message. I need to be, I need to be sure that if I, if I died today, if I, like that, like that person that was killed tragically, if, I, if that, if that be me on the highway, that be me in some car accident or me with some heart attack, some stroke. If I left this earth today, can I be sure? Can I be sure where I'll spend eternity? Maybe today you're not, you're not sure. Today you can be sure. And all you got to do to be sure is get up out of your seat. Yes, yes. Come down the aisle and you can be sure that the Lord will save you and that you'll spend eternity with him. Or maybe today you're not secure in your salvation. I've, I've accepted Christ, I've I'm, 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 I'm been baptized, I'm a Christian, but I'm not secure in my faith because I've, I've, I've strayed away from the path that I know I'm supposed to be on and I'm, I'm not secure in my faith. Today, you can re-secure your security by getting up out of that seat, coming down the aisle and rededicating your life to him. Or maybe the day you're saying, my life is not satisfying. I'm, I'm not fulfilled in life. I, I'm, I'm missing something. God bless you, I see you. I'm, I'm missing something from my life. My life is, is not what I want it to be. I'm not fulfilled. I'm not satisfied with where I am or even who I am. I'm not satisfied with the direction of my life today. Today, you can accept Jesus Christ. Allow him to be your shepherd and be totally satisfied, not just with him, but with the life he gives to you. I don't know who you are, man, woman, boy or girl, but as the choir sings, I want you to get up out of your seat. Our leaders are standing in the aisle. They won't let you walk by yourself. They can't walk for you, but they can walk with you. Our choir is going to sing now. We want you to get up out of that seat. Come down the aisle and make the most important decision of your life. Won't you come today? Won't you come? Won't you come? We're waiting on you. There's nothing better. Won't you come today? Come on, take it out. 
just tell him, come on, come on, come on. church should really be praying. If you're already in Christ, in good standing with Christ and the church, this is where you pray for someone who's in the sanctuary now, who's on the brink of making the most important decision. Because I know that there's at least one person who's saying, now I need to come down the aisle and make a change. So I want the church to be praying that whoever that person is will make that decision for the Lord today and they won't try to put it off and say, I'll do it next week or I'll do it next month or I'll do it uh, next year or I'll do it whenever. But this is where you're really praying church and and really seeking the power of the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, don't let them grieve the Spirit. Don't let them quench the Spirit that whoever it is that pastor's talking about that they'll make that decision and they'll get out of their seat and come down the aisle and make that choice. This is where the church is praying. And for that person who's here today I don't know who you are or why you're still seated, but you know, you know I'm talking to you. And for whatever reason, you, you're still there because you want to you wanna fix this first. And, and once you fix this um, and get this together, then you're going to be ready to join the church and change your life. And then you're going to be ready to do And the Lord is saying, wait a minute, if you could fix yourself by yourself, you wouldn't need a shepherd to die for you. 